Welcome back to the 411 Podcasting Network. I am your host, Larry Zonka, and this is episode 67 of the 411 on Wrestling Podcast. You can follow us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, and of course, the 411mania.com website. Please make sure to subscribe to our show, share us around on social media, and if you have time, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Joining me today is my co-host and, dare I say, my best friend, Jeremy Lambert. Jeremy, how are you? Best friend. Okay. I'm pretty I'll sure about it. that, dude. I mean, you're the only one I talk to all the time and, like, comes to visit me. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Fair enough. Yeah, we got to do the uh, the best That's friend right. hug with the Okada Zoom out then. Uh, hi, I'm good. I'm doing well. It's another Wednesday night in That's the right. books. Another, uh, I had another fun Wednesday night myself. I enjoyed the shows. How about you? Yeah, it's Wednesday night's always a, a ton of fun. And I was really curious about AEW this week because they were coming off the pay-per-view. This was their first post-pay-per-view show. So I was excited to see how they would handle the fallout. And then NXT building towards war games. So it's That's good right. time, Yeah, um, I had a good day overall. I was, uh, I was trying to figure out what I was going to cook for lunch today, Jeremy. And I'm like, kind of didn't want to cook. But I'm like, ah, fuck it. You know, I'm going to go cook something. And, Sitting there, and then I got a little email on my phone, and there was a, a new restaurant in the area that was delivering via Grubhub, and I got a coupon code for not only $3 off, but uh, free delivery. And I'm like, well, fuck, that's like $6 off a normal order. I'm like, well, I'm going to give this place a go. So I ordered some lunch, and I was all happy, and sit there, and waiting for the guy to get here, watching on the little GPS gimmick on the phone, go upstairs, answer the door, and the guy's like, hey, how you doing? Here's your food. Hands it to me, and he looks out, and he goes, Hey, man, how'd you lose your leg? So, right away, it's like, pretty much when anybody that doesn't know me blurts that out, you're getting some bullshit. Because I'm just gonna fuck with people at this point in my life. I don't care. I, I lost a leg. What the hell's gonna happen now, right? So, I'm like, uh, well, I'm, uh, do you like golf? He's like... Yeah, he's like, what does that have to do with it? I said, I said I used to like golf too. He goes, okay. Um, I'm sorry. He's like, I don't understand how you lost your leg golf. And I said, I said, you ever hit into a water hazard? He's like, yeah. He's like a lot. He's like, I was never really good. I said, yeah. I said I did too. I said, uh, that's how I lost a leg. He goes, did you like? It's like, I just don't understand. I said, alligator, man. This poor dude, I kind of felt bad afterwards, had this mortified fucking look on his face. And I'm I'm just sitting there thinking, yeah, you deserve that. I'm sorry, dude. You just don't walk up to a person you didn't meet and, like, ask them how they <laughs> lost their leg, man. At least have a little conversation with me first, you know? How's your day going? Looks like a nice wheelchair. By the way... <laughs> <laughs> Give me a little something before you hit me with the high you lose your leg thing. Oh, the food, the food good at uh, least. I'm gonna not only order from there. I might even go check the place out. It was a, it's like a little uh, breakfast lunch place. It was a little little local grill in Gastonia, and uh, I got a delicious hamburger. And uh, because I had to hit the ten dollar limit, I had got a little. I got a side of a biscuit and sausage gravy, so I got to try some lunch and breakfast. It was very good. Their side options are actually really nice. It's just not like fries and shit. You can get like fries, onion rings, and you can get like breakfast sides, and they have like vegetables. They have a salad. Then they also have like mozzarella sticks and mini corn dogs as an option. I was like, holy shit. I'm like, well, check you guys out. I'm like, all right. Yeah, food was really good though. So I I slightly feel bad for her as the driver, but it's a, uh, you know, I have very few uh, enjoyments in life sometimes, so I just. Take them where I can get them. That's good. I'm glad the food was at least good. And that guy, uh, yeah, you gave him the, right. the Happy Gilmore story. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, you gotta use that one every once in a while. I didn't know if this guy, he he looked semi-serious, so I didn't know if he'd buy me surfing off the Great Barrier Reef in the shark attack story. So, that's a good one too. <laughs> and then I have, I have the bear one in the woods. That's a, another nice one. So, but yeah, got to have a little bit of fun. So, but we're going to talk about the Wednesday night shows, Jeremy. But first of all, 
Let's talk about WWE Backstage and the return of CM Punk. Yeah, they um, they fucking announced this shit midnight on, I guess, Wednesday on, like, their least watched show. <laughs> what a... I mean, I guess he's going to be on Backstage, but... Jesus, what what a time to do yeah, it! Yeah, I was uh, I was pretty funny. I was like, cause like everybody's like, oh, backstage is on. This show sucks. Nothing's going on. Blah blah blah. There's like this line of tweets on my feed, and then like there's eight thousand fucking feeds of holy shit, CM Punk's on TV. I'm like, where? Yeah, I'm like, like <laughs> what are we talking about here? I'm like, where the hell is he? And then they're like, he's on Fox, and I'm like, well, technically it's not Fox. Be more specific. It's Fox Sports One, please. Like, help everybody out that has no idea why he's on TV. Right. It was they hit like the like the first forty five minutes of that show was just like nothing. They just talk about WWE and do promo school or whatever, and then uh, they do the big contract news with Miz and Paige. I was literally all like the last 10 minutes of the show. They do the contract thing with Miz and Paige and Gargano not being cleared. And then they announce team SmackDown for survivor series. And then the last 30 seconds here, CM Punk. It's like, Jesus, y'all couldn't have spaced out some of this new stuff. Like some of us, uh, d- us reporters got lives and shit. We don't feel like writing three news stories in 10 minutes. Yeah, Jerks. pretty much. Uh, you and I have talked about the possible return of CM Punk in some capacity to WWE when this news first broke. Um, So he's kind of back. It's through Fox. He's going to appear on this show um, at least uh, next week and then I guess sporadically depending on scheduling or whatever. Here's the big question, Jeremy, and I think everybody's thinking of it. I mean, is this going to lead to the in-ring return in WWE for him? We all know that AEW made a play for him, reportedly offered him some good money. But, uh, I mean... I like how I like how that's the, they offered him good money. Like, what do you think? I They're going to offer right? him a they, shitty They deal? offered him a hot dog and a handshake. What the fuck? But, I mean, uh, obviously... <laughs> um, you know, allegedly the deal is through Fox, and Fox has big money because they're paying WWE a billion dollars over the next five years. And even if it's not Fox and it's WWE, they have two billion dollars in TV deals and all that Saudi money coming in. So they're not above paying for somebody to come back. Do you think he's back in the ring, and will it be for WrestleMania? Uh, if it's going to be anywhere, it's going to be WrestleMania because, yeah, the, w- where else would you do that at? I think it will happen. I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I don't know for sure. But he's going to be around it a lot. He's going to be talking about it a lot. He's going to he's gonna get the itch a little bit. They're going to pay him really well. It, I... I I think it'll happen. I think it'll happen. The thing is, is like if he does return and I think it's very likely because things change and yeah, he was the, you know, I'm happy. Fuck this stuff. Don't need to go back for the longest time. And that's all well and good. I mean, things change, but the thing is too, is he is now in a position of power. They didn't want him out there. They don't want him going to AEW. They don't want him going anywhere else. They have the money to pay him. And the thing is, he's in that position of power, so he could... First of all, this this deal is probably a sweet deal. He's getting paid good money to do nothing but talk. Which, hey, more power to you. If you can get that deal, that's awesome. And maybe he never does return. Maybe he's just a talking head and hangs out with his friends and is happy and whatever, and that's good. But if he does return, he is... I, I will say he that dude is never working a full schedule again. There's no fucking no, way. No, de- definitely not. I yeah, if he's gonna do it, I think he does just a mania one off <laughs> feud, and that's kind of it. And, and he probably wrestles somebody like 
Brian or somebody he's, you know, he's comfortable with, who's not going to like push him to a, a really hard style. Like he'll they'll push him in the ring. Like if you wrestle Brian or Joe or one of his friends from those days, like he'll be pushed in the ring. But those guys aren't wrestling the the style of like a Matt Riddle or somebody like that. Although maybe he could wrestle Matt Riddle and then he can say he has a UFC victory as well. Fair enough. But yeah, I mean, uh, and like I said, we we talked talked about this before, and we speculated on it. We both at the time, I think, felt he would be back in some way, and um, I think obviously the Punk announcement is uh, an appearance last night is obviously really interesting considering week one of that show did like forty nine thousand viewers. So I think Fox was like, "Well, we need to do something. Open up the checkbook." Yeah, it did seem kind of I mean, maybe it was planned and they had it all planned for week two. But honestly, like, why not just do it the premiere episode? That's when you would think you would have your largest audience, but they clearly didn't have their largest audience. And maybe we're so used to debut shows doing well and then tanking after that that it's it's odd to see a debut show doing shitty and then yeah, now going very up. interesting and um. I did laugh when WWE posted on Twitter about CM Punk appearing on the show, but they didn't add him. And Renee Young is all like, don't be a coward at that man. Renee Young's awesome. Um, We didn't talk about it on Full Gear, but her tweets during the Moxley match are amazing. Uh, Renee's great, and I'm glad she's off of raw and doing something she's just far better at and she also far more seems extremely at. happy with it too which is the best thing too because i mean she was probably miserable on commentary with vince yelling at her all the time and stuff i mean and i'm never gonna say she didn't try because there were times where she was okay and then it just the more it went on it was very obvious the commentary thing was not for her and it's Three man, three well, person booths. They just suck. Aren't I mean, good. Raw wasn't a good show this week, but the commentary I felt was better with only two people because it didn't feel as forced and all that bullshit. And I just, yeah, I generally don't like the three man booth. It just it annoys me most times, and it's it's rarely an improvement over a good two man booth because there's very rare instances of good three man booths. I think AEW does it pretty well, um, mainly because it limits Fair. Jim Ross. But otherwise, yeah, three three man booths aren't. So aren't Jeremy, very good. Are, are you going to call it? Is, is he wrestling at WrestleMania? Yeah, he wrestles at WrestleMania. I don't know who he wrestles, but he wrestles at WrestleMania. John Cena. There you go. Punk versus Cena. Cena. One match. last time. That's your match. Yeah, sure. Shit, Punk might main event. Like it's John yeah, we'll Cena, finally get his honestly. big main event. There you go. So yeah, yeah, so I mean, CM Punk is back, and there's going to be a lot of people out there that do the "I told you so." Well, I mean, is it really an "I told you so" if you've been saying it for six years? Like everybody's been guessing about it for six years. I mean, we've all speculated and talked about it. When this news came out, Jeremy and I both thought there was a very good chance. It's not an "I told you so" thing. The dude made a choice. I mean. Hey, if he's happy, and like I said, if he gets paid and ends up just doing backstage for a long time and ends up not coming back but gets paid just to talk, again, that's a that's a damn fine position to be in. Position of power, Jeremy, a good thing. Yeah, I mean, if he just does the backstage show, like he's getting paid well, he can live his normal life, and... Good on him. Shit, it's a lot better than actually going in the ring, busting your ass, doing that whole schedule, and you know, getting criticized for it and stuff. Like he gets to criticize others now. This is a dream job for Punk. He just gets to sit there and be like, "This, this sucks. This is good," and that that's it. Like this is CM Punk. He can maybe he'll come off a little bit bitter. I don't know, but um, I'm sure he'll be I happy did- with it. So. Is AJ Lee going to return? Go. That's what people I want did to find it funny, though, that, like, the same people that have been like, I hope Punk comes back. I can't wait for Punk to come back. I miss Punk. I've seen some of these very same people. Now that he's doing backstage, Punk's such a fucking sellout now, man. Wait, 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 wait. You've been begging for the dude to come back, and now you're going to call your man a sellout? It's like, pick a position. I mean, you you were begging for him to come back. 
I see these people on Twitter and in our comments section on 411. Same people. God, I'd love for Punk to come back. There's so many new guys he could work with. And he, he could be a main event guy and just, you know, work a reduced schedule like Orton or Sean used to and blah, blah, blah. That'd be so great. And he's a star. And I miss him so much. And that's great. I mean, it's like if you want your guy to come back, awesome. But five minutes after he's back to start flooding the site with, what a fucking sellout. I can't believe he took the offer and came back. What's well, like, first of all, he's not officially back. He's doing WWE backstage. Again, do I think he comes back? Likely so. Because like Jeremy said, he's going to be around. He's going to talk about wrestling, hanging around his friends. Probably gets the bug. Maybe there's a match that, you know, Vince throws a match at him he really wants. Or maybe he gets to work somebody new that he's never worked that really interests him. We'll see. But, I mean, it's it's a choice. And, I mean... I I don't know. I just uh, I just don't think you can turn on your man after begging him to come back for like six years. You know. This is this is wrestling. Of course, they can yeah. turn on him. Well, I mean, it is what it is, Jeremy. But uh, so that's the CM Punk thing. Anything else you'd like to add? No, I'm looking forward to next week's WWE backstage. See what he has to say. See kind of just how he comes off. On the show, I, I suspect next week we'll do pretty you big would numbers. Think so, uh, if it doesn't, that's not good. But yeah, you would think it does good numbers. So, uh, so it sounded. I mean, the time slot isn't great. Like it's fucking, you know, eleven o'clock on yeah, a Tuesday, which is not good. So, uh, so now it is time to talk about uh, the Wednesday Night Wars, Jeremy, our favorite time of the week. AEW Dynamite, November 13th, 2019. The fallout from the Full Gear pay-per-view. Um, we opened up with highlights of the pay-per-view, and then we got a recap of the Omega versus Moxley uh, main event. Omega was uh, with the trainer, is all beat up, and is not medically cleared to compete tonight. But John Moxley was. Yeah, Omega's a pussy, apparently. He didn't hurt Moxley enough. Uh, And Michael Nakazawa was backstage there with the trainer, which uh, segued nicely into the opening match, which was John Moxley pretty much destroying Michael Nakazawa 45 seconds. It was exactly what it needed to be. I did like that Michael Nakazawa came out and he did none of his comedy bullshit. He was actually serious because he wanted to try to get revenge for his friend Kenny Omega. He failed, of course, got his ass beat, and... uh, Again, under a minute, exactly what it needed to be. And that led to a promo from John Moxley, Jeremy, which he started off with, this one counts, right? <laughs> Maybe. If he asks like that, then uh, Tony Khan, the voice of Tony Khan, might be like, no, jerk. It's so, yeah, not he said count. he was not a liar. He delivered as advertised at full gear. Omega will never be the same again. But he will admit that Omega is a radical son of a bitch and that he does respect him because he had the balls to get into the ring with him in his match. Moxley will scorch the earth of AEW until he's the last man standing, but if anybody wants some, he'll let them know where they stand. Uh, But if you do, kiss your loved ones goodbye and have an ambulance ready because there will be no apologies. Jeremy, your thoughts on the opening match and promo? Uh, Moxley's threatening murder, and I'm for that. Fair enough. I mean, yeah. Uh, and again, this is one of those things we talked about. If you guys listen to the Full Gear podcast, Jeremy and I talked a lot about the uh, the kind of early issues with the promotion, the pacing of the shows, uh, the need for video packages, a little bit more promo work from key people like a John Moxley, and we got that here, which I think is a good thing. Yeah, I'm all for John Moxley exactly. getting promo. Uh, next up, the Dark Order defeated Jurassic Express. 925 via pin. Jeremy, your thoughts? It was fine. I I like the Dark Order in this match, and I liked them uh, the other week against Private Party as well. I, I, their ring work, there's nothing wrong with that. The, the, the character work, I, I still have issues with because it's just it's all over the place even this post-match angle it was like okay so i guess uh evil uno is the the leader here and the other guys even grayson are just like his his minion people and like why does he want these people to join the dark order like what are they after like what's their goal here so i I wish we just knew a little bit more about them and i don't I, i wasn't on the podcast last week but one thing gotta mention is fucking like 
you know, who are these guys? And then you see Stu Grayson backstage with the um, elastic bands, you know, getting his pump on before the match. Like, these evil dudes are just using elastic bands to do bicep curls and stuff. Come on. It just... I don't know who they just are. Just because you're evil doesn't mean them. you neglect your you know staying in shape and getting the pump on before you go out in front of the camera, Jeremy. <laughs> sure, I guess, but it was just just very weird to see these guys who are the Dark Order and they're just hanging out by the steps backstage, and one of them is doing doing a party pump. Like, don't they have a spaceship or something to to do this shit? <laughs> Apparently in? not. I don't know if they're quite aliens, Jeremy. So, uh, yeah. I, I don't want I, I just figure anything. They got minions and stuff. They, it doesn't have to be like an alien spaceship. Uh, like a uh, fucking Power Rangers, Rita Repulsa, you know? She had her little minions and, and stuff going around. That That's what it reminds me of. She had a spaceship, right? She had a spaceship. Uh, she had like an evil, some kind of wacky she had some type of. Yeah. She had some type of. Yeah, ship in space or so. Yeah, an evil headquarters. How about that? It doesn't have to be a spaceship. Fine, but you know, some type of headquarters, not just hanging out backstage. So they need by the a lockers. backstage area like LAX used to have in uh, Impact, where it's like their evil uh, headquarters. Yeah, like Legion of Doom. Yeah, do a, I? I guess AEW doesn't want to do that kind of wacky. Like, meanwhile, <laughs> at the Dark Order headquarters, and then you, you know, cut to. Uh, a, a video package from like earlier in the day or something but uh, you know you got to do something with these guys because they're they're good talents and i think they they've been getting over with their ring work and i think there is something there that's different from a lot of the stuff we we see in aew the problem is their their presentation is yeah. just a uh, good there match right overall uh, dark order pick, picked up the rebound win jurassic express still winless and then you talked about the post-match angle, and I will say at least it looks like they're trying to do something. I mean, you can't fix it all in one week. I do largely agree with your kind of broad strokes point, though. They need to give a little more to what these dudes are and why we care about. But the the post-match was Evil Uno put over Marco Stunt for being a good little fighter and tried to recruit him into the Dark Order and offered him one of the Creeper Masks. And Jungle Boy put a stop to that, and then the Creepers all attacked. Big beatdown ensued. And then, Jeremy, the biggest star on the show so far, the Lucha fucking Soros returned. My man was over. He started destroying creepers, hit a giant choke slam in the ring, out of the, to out of the ring onto a pile of them, choke slam Grayson, hit a standing moonsault, hugged with his pals. The Lucha Soros was over. Lucha Soros is over, and he apparently has extremely great healing powers because he was supposed to be out for like months um he was out just less than a month so you know he he worked everyone at starcast being like yeah january is when i'll be back and you know we're still six weeks away from january seven weeks maybe so luchasaurus over cool to see him i thought some of the spots looked dumb but whatever like his tail whip thing Pretty sure he didn't connect with that first guy. Um, but he's over. The The man is over. And uh, he, he's, he's, he's good in this gimmick or he's good with this group because now Marco Stunt looks even smaller and Jungle Boy do, isn't like the big dude in the tag team anymore because Jungle Boy being the big dude in the tag team is just – it doesn't work. So now with Luchasaurus there, uh, Jungle Boy's role, uh, he he gets moved into a, a better role for him. And Marco Stunt, more people will complain that he's even smaller than he was before, even though he didn't Fair shrink. Enough. It looks like he shrank though next to the Luchasaurus. But he had his uh, Jurassic powers yeah. to recover though. So I'm glad he's back though. Glad it wasn't out and uh, glad it wasn't more serious than it could have been. So yeah, I, I kind of liked sure. that he was working everybody at Starcast though. That's great. Uh, next up, we had a triple threat match where Darby Allen defeated Sean Spears, Peter Avalon, 340. Uh, partway through the match, Joey Janela appeared, brawled with Sean Spears to the back. That allowed Darby Allen to pick up the win. Uh, so they continued Sean Spears and Joey Janela, which we kind of figured they would after the pay-per-view. And uh, Darby Allen gets a win to get back on track. Peter Avalon is perfectly fine in his enhancement role because he is a good worker and it didn't go too long which again is an important thing. No, no need for this to go any longer than it did. 
And then this was always set up for the post-match for Darby Allen to call out John Moxley and accept his challenge from earlier in the show. I don't know why Sean Spears was needed in this match outside of they wanted to continue the thing with Janela, but like just have Janela attack him backstage or something. And maybe they, I guess they don't do back. They did a backstage attack later. Maybe they didn't want to do too many backstage attacks. Uh, honestly, we're, we're just getting too many attacks on, on this show because, you know, we had, we had one here. We had one, the, the segment before with Dark Order and Luchasaurus, we had a couple more later on in the night. It's just a, a lot of attacks going on. Same same with NXT. It's it's attack time in wrestling. It's a war um, Yeah, ma- match, I guess so. Ma- match wasn't anything special because it didn't last long enough. And Darby winning, the right call. Glad Darby was back on TV. He's awesome, and he's got a death wish. So yeah, I'm all he for may that die too. next week when he faces John Moxley. John Moxley killed this man in front of like twenty people for uh, Northeast Wrestling. He's gonna he's gonna definitely kill him in front of millions for go. AEW. Uh, next up, Nyla Rose defeated uh, Danny Jordan one thirty five via pin. A fine squash to help reestablish Nyla Rose. Yeah, uh, they announced that Dustin Rhodes should be back training in a few weeks from his broken arms at the hand of Jake Hagar. No update on his testicles after the low blow, though. Um, they're, they're probably fine. They, it took Hagar two to knock that <laughs> one guy out of the fight, and uh, Dustin Rhodes has stronger testicles than that fighter, I would imagine. So that's probably why there's no update. It, Hagar didn't Fair damage enough. him. Really. Uh, they announced next week there will be a 12 man diamond battle royal, uh, with the final two guys in the match uh, facing off the next week for a special diamond ring battle bull style. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. I don't know what the fuck this diamond ring is all about, and I don't know. I, I assume it'll play into the storyline, but I'm a big Battle Bowl fan, and wacky gimmicks like this are, are cool with me. Bring back World War go. Three, you cowards. Uh, Allie was then interviewed next. She was here to show what she can do, but she was screwed because what she could do was get her ass kicked because Kong and Brandy arrived, kicked the shit out of her, chopped off some of her hair as Kong took another scalp for her fancy hair belt. It was fine. I the I'm I'm I like the Kong and and Brandy gimmick. It's cool, except they just do the lights Fair out enough. thing too much. Uh, yeah, they it, they're using it a little too much as a transition thing, which is what we talked about on the last show. Just don't do it for Sean Spears' entrance. Like I, it works fine with Brandy and Kong's entrance because. It's cool, like the the MJF one um, in the next segment works. The the Christopher Daniels thing at Full Gear w- was fine, but then you just use it on a random Sean Spears entrance. Like no one cares about this guy. You don't need this lights out gimmick for him. Just have him come out with a chair. He doesn't need to be sitting there. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree because it's like. It's just, I don't know, fucking lights go out and there's fucking Sean Spears in his little hoodie sitting there. It's like, okay. Fine. <laughs> so. Or just only bring him back from, com- only do his entrances during commercial break or something. That way when you come back, he's already yeah, just, there. It's like, hey, here's, here's yeah, the 10 guy. do something different, so. Uh, next up, Jeremy, the champion Chris Jericho arrived. And we got a big promo segment with him and MJF. Uh, Jericho basically said, much to the chagrin of many, he is still the champion. He's the greatest of all time and is still demanding a thank you from every member backstage of the AEW roster and management. The people that matter and not these jackasses in Nashville. He's beaten everybody put in front of him and proved Cody was an entitled millennial son of a bitch. And this led to Cody's music hitting. And everybody got all excited because Cody's gimmick hits and the spotlight hit and he starts rising up from the stage, but it was that son of a bitch MJF, Jeremy. Yeah, this this was a proper use of... You, you kind of knew it was going to be MJF. Like He had to come out at some point and they hadn't advertised him throughout and you know he wasn't going to close the show because they had the the big tag team title match and so the top of the hour segment was the the best time for him so it, like 
you kind of knew it was MJF, but it still worked because he, he played off of uh, Cody's whole gimmick. So Chris Jericho's promo was, yeah, was so, great. Yeah, and he this. got big heat for it. He got the big asshole chance, and then he looked at Jericho and told Christopher that they would talk later. Uh he threw in the towel to. He explained that he threw in the towel to, towel to save Cody's career at the pay per view. So he's not the villain Cody is. Everybody loves Cody, but Cody doesn't get a shit about the fans and only cares about himself. He knows the real Cody. The real Cody is a liar, a user, and an abuser. And he took a young kid in MJF and saw someone he could try to make into a puppet. Cody wanted to be his mentor, but MJF knew that's bullshit because Cody claimed to care about him, but Cody just wanted to keep him under his thumb. Said you can't hold him down because he is the new face of AEW. He's better than Cody, and Cody knows it. Cody's not here, doesn't care about the fans, but he is a big fan of Jericho and knows Jericho wants him in the inner circle. They had some wacky banter where he was like, do you want me in the inner circle? And Jericho's like, do you want to be in the inner circle? He's like, but do you want me in the inner circle? Do you want to be in the inner circle? It was kind of wacky, but it worked really well because they were such smug assholes. MJF said he knew Jericho would like him to be in the inner, inner circle jerk. Pardon my expression, he said. And knows Jericho loves the bubbly, but thinks that Jericho likes drinking too much because the fastest rising star is the industry doesn't need him. Jericho said MJF wants to be like him. They're both handsome and love scars. And I quote, It's almost like your parents got horny when they were watching me beat up Juventud Guerrero 25 years ago on WCW Saturday night. And nine months later, your little twerp ass popped out. Died. Fucking dead. Uh, good Jericho one. invites him to join the inner circle. They argued, but they then agreed that Cody is the biggest jackass in all of AEW. They hugged in a are we now friends moment. And um, so Cody arrived, charges the ring, he attacks. And then this led to the debut of the Wardlow, Jeremy. The big giant man we've seen like two video packages for before. Took out Jericho, aligned with MJF. Uh, choked out Cody with his tie, hung him over the ropes. MJF now has a heater to back him up. Cody's laid out. He was busted open from the cut. He got a full gear. Overall segment thoughts, Jeremy. Um, on MJF's promo delivery timing, it's like his his work is great. He's he's an amazing amazing promo. Got plenty of heat. Content questionable. I I like the whole you know Cody was gonna hold me down type thing. I, I didn't like the, you know, Cody doesn't care about the fans and, and that's why I threw in the towel to, to save his career, but he doesn't care about you anyway. I, I think the, the better play would have been, I did this and now he's never going to get a title shot again. Like, I fucked this guy over. He thought he was going to hold me down. You know, he wanted me to take me under his wing. He was going to win the title. And then because he's my best friend, I'm never going to get a title shot. And I fucked him over by throwing in this towel. Now he's never going to get the title. And I'm going to go on to be the biggest thing in this company. I thought that would have been a better explanation. But, you know, that's just me. Um... The, the Jericho, MJF, back and forth, again, they were great at what they were doing. Went a little too long for me. I was like, okay, th- this can end. Um, but the you know the ending line, taking a shot at Cody w- was funny, and then them hugging. Uh, Cody coming out, he, he fucked up the, the power slam, which thank God no one died on that. I did like Jim Ross actually tried to save this. I wish he'd do the same thing for the referees once in a while by saying Cody's equilibrium was messed up. He's still injured from from the match and everything. But then they did the spot again, so it's just like, eh. I mean, obviously, they didn't know they were going to screw it up. They didn't know that Jim Ross was going to cover for them there. But to do it right afterwards, it basically just says, oh, yeah, by the way, we kind of just screwed that up, so let's do it again. And then Wardlow came out, and you know I'm glad MJF does have this heater because he he's not going to wrestle all the time, and you you want a guy like that to almost hide behind people. Like it's great in MLW when he just essentially hides behind Hammerstone and 
and uh, Richard Holiday. So now he's got that guy in AEW, big muscle man for him. And I, I think that's great. So overall, I, I mean, I expressed my complaints about the segment, but as far as how everyone came off and then the heat it generated, you make a really fair good criticism stuff. criticism about the overall content of some of the MJF stuff. I think it largely worked. I think the bigger takeaway, though, is that his um, – his delivery and execution, I think, is what most people are going to remember because this was his big spot. Uh, it's like, how many times yeah. do you see a guy get that big promo shot? Like when Matt Hardy had the feud with Edge and stuff, and then when he finally got his big promo moment, it was just like it's Matt Hardy talking a little bit, and it wasn't that good. So, I mean, again, fair, very fair criticism. I wish he would have dove into the uh, screwing Cody over a little more and why. But in terms of execution and going toe-for-toe toe with Jericho, um, I think it's a great, um, great, basically, debut promo for him because this was his first big promo and everything. Overall, I thought the sick got it. See, I... I never I never doubted that he wasn't like going to deliver here because he did the promo at what Fighter Fest or Fight for the Fallen where he ran down everybody. He did the promo with um Bret Hart and Hangman at what was that double or nothing where he he ran down everybody like this guy can talk. I understand this was his his first big kind of dynamite promo, but like this guy all he does, you go to a convention and see this guy like all he does is cut promos on people. He is in character 24-7. So I never doubted that his delivery and all this stuff would, you know, was going to be bad. Like I knew he would knock that part of it out of the park. And that's why I did focus just more on the content because I was never worried about anything else. I wanted to know what the motivation was for the character. And while he explained some things and like, it, it's not a lie what he's saying. I mean, I guess it is, but it, what he's saying is his truth. I just think they could have done a better no, job. And again, I, I don't think you're wrong at all, but I do think that I, I didn't have any doubts overall, but I was a little worried just for the fact that it's one thing to cut a promo in MLW. It's one thing to cut a promo at fighter fest. It's one thing to do all the stuff he does at the conventions. Uh, but this was the big thing, and sometimes nerves get the best of the best. And he shook it off completely and was fucking great. So I love that. And um, I, I, I like the Wardlow pairing because I like him having a big heavy. You know, I, I think that's good. I think he'll play really well off that. Like you said, he's done some of that in MOW with, like, Hammerstone in front of him and stuff. So, again, though, I, I think this is really, really good stuff. And, again, a lot of guys... I saw a lot of people in the live coverage that were like really surprised. And it's like, I don't know why you were surprised overall. Cause it's like a lot of people have been talking about it. He's really good. Just give him a chance. And he knocked it out of the park. And that's the big takeaway. I think. Yeah, he did great. He came off like a huge star and now he's got a, like he's going to feud with Cody. And that's kind of the biggest feud in the company, even if it's not yeah, for the so world he's title. He's definitely going to get a chance to deliver there, both in the ring and on the mic and everything. So looking forward to that. We went back to the ring, Jeremy, for our rubber match between the Bastard Pack and Hangman Page. The Bastard Pack defeated Hangman Page 1205 via submission with the Brutalizer. Uh, I thought they had another very good match. Uh, they played really well off of their previous matches. They had some good callbacks. Pack teased the brain buster on the chair on the floor like he used it to pay-per-view. Um, really enjoyed it overall. Pack has been, like, so good on TV. He comes across just like a star in every match. Everything looks so effortless to the guy. Page again did well, and it's just, I, I think Pack winning is the right call. Um... And I think what really worked here is that the match was not only really good, but earlier in the show, they did a ton of angle-driven stuff, shorter matches and everything. And that's that contrast we talked about in the Full Gear podcast. So that when you have a match like this, like it's great if you have like three or four great matches and stuff, and that's a lot of fun at times. But you also have to break it up and do some other stuff and tell some other stories which they did earlier in the show, which I felt made this match stand out even more than maybe normal. 
It was a good match. I I still question having Pac losing at the pay-per-view just to get his win back here. Like I understand it's a series. I like me personally, I would prefer to have that undefeated guy over just taking a loss on the pay-per-view when you know that you're going to get him the win back uh, four or five days later. So just why not keep the the guy's record perfect? And so when he does get beat, like it, it means a little bit more. Um, but but that's just me because I, I don't think pay, Hangman beating Pack at the pay per view like it looks like it means less now because he just lost a, a few does. days later. We talked about and that I get, Sunday. Like, it's like. When when you told me that they were booking this match, and I was kind of like, "Why?" I'm like, "It's that's why I thought Pat Pack should have won at the pay per view too." It's it's yeah, it's kind of a misstep in that regard. But he did win here, and the dude looks good. I just yeah, I wish they wouldn't have forced the series thing, especially because it, like we said Sunday when we talked, it was the third time in seven weeks. Yeah, it, it was just it was just too much. And I get the story they're trying to tell with Hangman is, you know, he's right there, but he can't quite do it. Like, he got the shot against Jericho, but he didn't win the match. Um, he, him and Omega won a match, but then they lost to, to Jericho and Sammy. You know, okay, he loses the pack, but then he beats pack at the pay-per-view, but then he ultimately loses the series. So he, he wins a battle, but loses the war. Like, I get the story. They're trying to tell with Hangman. I just, I don't know if it's really clicking right yet. And I, I think they're they almost sacrificed Pac a, a little bit of what made him special in in trying to to tell this whatever you know is Hangman elite kind kind of story. So I would have just kept Pac undefeated, be a bastard, just beat people, and then set him up for put the title yeah, on. And Pac. again, this is, we talked about this in the full year thing. I just I wish they would have avoided it too, but at least the match was really good, and you know I'll take that away. And again, like I said, they're mixing up the formula of the show a little bit, which again we heavily talked about in that last show. Uh, backstage, the Bucks were brawling with Santana and Ortiz. Santana dove off of a forklift. Uh, they were all brawling. They knocked open a bathroom door and Orange Cassidy was just standing there being Orange Cassidy and got a big pop for being Orange Cassidy, which I laughed at because seriously, the dude is just standing there and everybody popped. Yeah, but when oh, you're over, but it's you're just over, like, brother. he's like a fucking Easter egg in the Marvel universe. Now he's just like popping up in like the most random places. And it's hilarious. <laughs> uh, they, they, yeah, that's so. Uh, that's they a good they, they way to took it. out security, brought into the arena. Santana and Ortiz used a blackjack. They took out Nick's injured leg from the pay per view with it. They attacked Matt, painted a target on the stage, power bombed him through it like he was Ricky Morton. Brandon Cutler tried to make the save. He got taken out. Private party finally ran them off as security uh, came out. And uh, Santana and Ortiz faced private party next week as well as Mox versus Allen. The the brawl was was cool. It was and still kind of like just a lot of attacks going on and I mean the I don't know who who initiated this brawl anyway. It looked like the Bucks did. Or they're sore losers. They they lost at the pay per view, then they even got their heat back with a uh, Rock and Roll Express and then they attacked these men backstage. They're 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 Setting very sore losers, these the young heat. bucks. Yeah. Um Cody kind of did the same thing. At least Cody had had more of a reason. Like he got kicked in the balls, and his his supposed friend threw in the towel on him. So at least at least Cody had a reason to to be upset. The, you guys lost fair and square. What are you mad about? Um, I like the brawl though. I like the spray paint gimmick that I guess proud and powerful are doing. I'm not calling them that. Santana Orner T- and Ortiz are doing uh, where they spray paint the target and then power pump someone through it. I think that's cool. I'd like to see them do this for, you know, not just on the stage, like spray paint a car windshield and then put someone through that. Uh, I think they could do some, some funny stuff with that. So I liked it in private party and, uh, Santana and Ortiz next week should be good except uh, the problem with it is spoiler alert the the best friends beat Private Party on AEW Dark so we're gonna watch these guys lose to the best friends who have like no wins 
on Tuesday, and then we're ex- supposed to, you know, take them serious against uh, Santana and Ortiz. Like I, that just doesn't yeah, make sense. Yeah, I read that spoiler too, and I was like, that made no sense. So. I mean, I, I get that you want to have like the best friends not always lose, but if that's the case, then put them against someone they like they can beat. Like the Young Bucks beat T Hawk and Lindemann. Like why couldn't prior best friends just beat those guys? They, did the Young Bucks really need a, a win? Like they're fine. I guess, I guess they want to win because they just lost, but like they're they're fine. The Young Bucks could have faced someone else I, I don't know i just like why why beat private party knowing that 24 hours later the viewing audience is going to watch them against um the, the uh, possibly your your top team or at least your your second you know, they, team they've right used now. alex reynolds and john silver in the past who are a really good independent tag team bring those dudes in to do the job to the best friends because that would it would at least yeah, be a good I, I mean maybe yeah, maybe you want like you probably want a stronger main event than that, and I guess that's their thinking. They're like, "Oh, best friends, well, then you private put the party, Bucks like match that's a main event, strong and you main flop event." It around. Again, they, they should have put yeah, some yeah, uh, I, more I thinking agree. into that one. Yeah, yeah, or to use Angelico and Jack Evans, like they're beating them at every turn anyway. Yeah, they can throw lose Kip again. Kip Sabian and some other dude in there. Who cares? They're building Kip Allegedly. Sabian, brother. Anyway, main event time. Champions SCU defeated Le Champion Chris Jericho and the Spanish God Sammy Guevara in 11 minutes via pin. When Scorpio Sky cradled Le Champion to retain the titles, Jeremy. Yeah, I, I like this finish. They were clearly running short on time, but they, they're trying to... Here, here's the here's the thing. They're trying to get this cradle over. I'm not sure it's working because the crowd is just not popping at all for it. They're like the the reaction to this was kind of low and disappointing. The the same as the reaction when they like actually won the titles. This cradle, it's. It's. I like the finish. I, I said it when they won the titles. Like I think it's something different, and I, I completely like that they're going for it. This crowd ain't buying it. The, these main event matches, they want clean finishes with a million finishers and, and, and kickouts. They don't want this cradle nonsense. Fair enough, yeah. Um, yeah, I would have thought the pop would have been bigger, but I did enjoy the match. thought it was good. I thought it um, laid out really well, had a fun, well-done home stretch. And the thing is, is if you paid attention to that tag team tournament, I think one of the biggest things they tried to do was build up Scorpio Sky through that. And now he's the first guy to pin Jericho in the company. So that I'm pretty sure, you know, that's going to lead to a fun TV main event down the line. And I think that's, it's good because, you know, in, we keep talking about them trying to build stars with a Darby Allen private party and stuff like that. And I, I think they're trying to do something with Scorpio Sky, and I'm not against that. Uh, I specifically love Jericho throwing a fucking fit and destroying shit afterwards because I hate when somebody fucking loses and they do that little smile and point at the guy like, oh, you got me. No, Jericho is a conceited, arrogant asshole. He should be pissed off. He's never been beaten in AEW. He thinks he's perfect. He thinks everything is owed to him. He thinks everybody should thank him. He thinks he's the reason the company's on TV. He thinks he's the fucking shit. So the fact that he lost should fucking enrage him to no end. So I love that. Yeah, I like the post-match Timber Tantrum callback to the 90s Chris Jericho character there with the you know, chair slamming into the ring posts and stuff. So I like Jericho's reaction to all this. I like Scorpio Sky winning because I do think he has star potential. And I think the the TV main event that they eventually do will probably be really good. Um, you know, assuming, I mean, they'll probably get time. Yeah, so, yeah, it, it'll be a good match. It's just that finish is just coming off a little flat. But, you know, hopefully... Because you know when they do this TV main event, Scorpio Sky is going to cradle Chris Jericho. 
And when it happens, I, I hope it gets the reaction that it deserves because they are trying to get this over. And even though the reactions have been a little flat on the finishes, if they do this cradle, you know, 14 minutes into this main event match and it comes off as a near fall where the entire crowd buys it, then it's all worth it. Then those flat finishes are, are completely yeah, it's worth like, it. it's um, like when they were doing the um, Shooter Umino and uh, Tanahashi when he fucking almost beat him in the New Japan Cup. Everybody bought that small package at that one point because they buy when the Lions do that stuff. So, yeah, you're right. If they can get that one big reaction, definitely will be worth it. So, I think they'll have a good match when they have the match. Yeah, very good, probably, because both guys are really good. And I mean, Jericho, if, if, he's lo- if you've looked at everything he's done so far, I mean, he's been really giving in his singles matches. He was really giving to Paige, even though I didn't think it was a great match. He was extremely giving to Darby Allen, you know, and the Cody match was great. So I, I think even Scorpio Scott will have a damn fine match. Yeah, it, it'll be good. And Scorpio, he's he's getting over. Jericho's over. So, and uh, both guys, Scorpio can work, and Jericho can can work to his uh, so strengths. So that brings us to NXT for the evening. Jeremy kicked off in ring action. Cruiserweight champion Leo Rush defeating Angel Garza at twelve fifty via pin. I thought they had a really good opener. I thought it was a hot way to kick off the show. They had a good crowd for it. Everybody worked hard. The only thing I didn't like was the finish because Leo Rush makes his big comeback, hits the final hour for two, goes up top and hits one to a like partially standing Garza and pins him, but Garza had a hand on the ropes and the ref didn't see it. It felt kind of kind of cheap way to get to a rematch that they really didn't need to do because the match was really good. They're poking fun at AEW because the referees, they're blind. Um, I, I like the match. thought it was good. Leo and, and Garza are both fantastic pro wrestlers, so no surprise that the, the match w- was good. Yeah, the finish, th- maybe not necessary. Like, I get they're trying to build a rematch. The rematch will, will probably be great. You put this rematch on TakeOver and... It has, I don't know if they'll do that, but it does have a uh, show stealing potential in, in that regards. It's just, they didn't want to outright beat Garza. And if you, if you don't want to outright beat a guy just yet, then, then don't do it. Like nobody's forcing you to, to book this match. So it, the, the finish was a little too protective for my liking. Um, but the rematch will be fun. So we see, uh, Tegan Knox and, uh, Rhea Ripley had been laid out outside of the NXT arena. Hmm. And that led us back to the ring where the real fucking shooter, Zia Lee, defeated Aaliyah in two minutes and five seconds via pin when she kicked her in the fucking face and broke it. Busting her open. Yeah. 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 That that didn't look good. Um, yeah. Zia, Zia Lee. Uh, she might get a big push out of this. Ain't nobody trying to fuck with her right now. I feel bad for Aaliyah because that, that she's looked been like in it sucked. for like 19 years. Yeah, that's true, and I mean, that, that this isn't gonna, I mean, I don't think this was her fault, I don't know if anybody was, was really at fault, if anybody, Zaya, because she might have gone in a little too hard on it, but yeah, Aaliyah, you know, she, she's finally kind of found herself, and um, with uh, Vanessa Bourne, and yeah, the, this, this, the, this yeah, from what I can tell, like. it looks like she had her hands up. I just think uh, Zia Lee had a little too much starch on that kick. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what it looked like. So I, I think yeah. this is more on Zaya than than Aaliyah. That did don't fuck with Zia Lee. She'll Real kick you in the damn shooter. face. So, but right. yeah, she was legit busted open around her like nose and mouth and stuff. Had to be checked on after the match. So. Uh, she posted a nasty picture on like Instagram and Twitter showing that off. So, a uh, little rough looking. Uh, next, we got promo time with Finn Balor. Balor arrived and explained that he's no longer proud of NXT and calls it a joke. Said Johnny Gargano was supposedly the heart of NXT, but then he got injured from something that happened three weeks ago and he's not around anymore. Calls the roster a bunch of little boys crying for sympathy when they're hurt. Even guys like Matt Riddle got hit last week and hasn't been seen since. 
which of course lead, led to Matt Riddle arriving. He attacked. They brawled to the outside. Um, Balor backed off. Riddle tells him that he can't run forever. Undisputed was surrounded the ring. Adam Cole said that Riddle was in the wrong place at the wrong time, but Ciampa and uh, Keith Lee made the save. They had the big standoff. Keith Lee wanted to face Adam Cole, but Roddy Strong gave Adam Cole the night off and said he would face Big Keith Lee. Your thoughts? Uh, the Bauer promo was 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 fine. The whole thing with like, oh Matt Riddle, he got injured last week and hasn't been seen. Like, dude, y'all haven't had television since then. Like, where was he gonna show up? The live events? I don't know. I guess NXT did live events uh, this past weekend, um, but. Yeah, that like that was that was dumb. Uh, but I, I did like the the shots of Gargano. I thought I thought that was good. And then yeah, they, they set up Roddy Strong and, and Keith Lee, and I'm all for Roddy Strong and Keith and Lee. And that's what we got next. Keith Lee defeated North American Champion Roddy Strong 17-25 via pin. Uh, as we all know, Jeremy, these two guys are awesome. So they had a really good match. Yes. Um, everything they do is pretty much great. Um. So the win, the, the match not only helped build to the War Games match, which is set up, but it also sets up Lee as a potential title challenger after that show, which I did like as well. Yeah, I, I like Keith Lee winning here because he, you can beat champions in non-title matches to set up future title matches, and it works even better if it doesn't play take place immediately the, the next week and it doesn't look like this one will maybe that changes but i don't i don't think it should like let the you know let that simmer a little bit they're still going to be linked going into war games so it's not like it's just going to be completely forgotten about and, and then you you build it uh, to a little bit longer and be when you can actually potentially take the title off of roderick strong i don't think you're taking the title off of roderick strong uh, heading into war games because you you want to keep all the titles on undisputed era heading into heading into this pay per view. The match was was great. Both all three of these guys are both of these guys are awesome, and yeah, I, I like Keith Lee winning, and I look forward yeah, to, the to the, of the match. Undisputed era arrived. Chiampa attacked. Riddle joined in. They all brawled brawl until Finn Balor laid out Riddle with sling blade, running double stomp. And um, that uh, eventually Lee ended up picking up the win, but they uh, that set up the post match, which was undisputed era attacking Lee and Chiampa until Dominic Dajakovic made the big save, laid out Cole with feast your eyes, told Chiampa he wanted in war games and shook hands with them, and then after a bit of hesitation and tension, Keith Lee offered his uh former rival Dajakovic the big handshake. Yeah, it, it, Dajakovic gets into the, the War Games match, which is a good call, and it looked like that was the, I guess, fairly obvious call based on the past couple weeks of, of television. So I like this. Post-match angle w- was fine, and I guess things things kind of changed later in the night. Uh, outside, Jessamyn Duke, Marina Shafir, and Candice LeRae were all laid out. The hit man or hit woman continued. Trip Wage was there. He was not happy about it, and Scarlett Bordeaux made her low-key NXT on-screen debut checking on Candice LeRae. Scarlett Bordeaux was the attacker. She had Killer Cross doing all the dirty work, man. I'm telling you. Killer Cross does not exist. He is a mythical creature. Unfortunately for him, man, he didn't get that... uh, Guess he didn't get that release, man, because he would have been fun in the Wardlow role. He he really would have that that would have been a good role for him, but yeah, um, he, he yeah he's just stuck doing almost literally nothing yeah. right now. In uh, next up was Isaiah Swerve Scott defeating uh, Bronson Reed. Jeremy, twelve minutes via pin. Your thoughts? Shocked they got this much time, but I'm I'm glad they did. They had a good match. Bronson Reed's good. Swerve Scott good. Uh, I'm glad that Swerve Scott won as well. I think he they they've got something with him. It's just a matter of you know actually building him up and doing something with him. And they're trying. He's on 205 Live and stuff as well. So so they're giving him a fair amount of screen time across various uh, programs that they have. So I like this match and I like Swerve Scott. I hope yeah, they, I like they both stick guys. with him. I was surprised they got. 12- 
12 minutes this deep into the show as well, but it made sense when what came next came next, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But, uh, yeah, they got some time. I thought both guys got to shine. Good and fun match. Uh, it was a good, friendly match. They fist bumped at the beginning. They shook hands afterward. And they're, they're just good wrestle lads, Jeremy. Yeah, I we need to see, you know, kind of kind of where this goes because right now it just seems like a thrown on match on the show um with with nothing really behind it. So again, hopefully they get the behind Queen Kathy stuff. Kelly arrived to inform us that the locker rooms were on high alert after all the attacks this evening. They don't know if it's Raw or SmackDown and then announced that at TakeOver War Games since Gargano will not be competing, Finn Balor will now face Matt Riddle. Matt Riddle was officially out of the War Games match and replaced by Dijakovic. God bless Damn Kath right. Kelly. That's all I'll say. Um, the Riddle and Balor should be awesome. Glad that's happening. And now the Team Ciampa needs a fourth guy. And I don't know. You got any ideas for it? Because they haven't really hinted at too much. It doesn't seem uh, like Swerve Scott. If he's healthy, Velveteen Dream. Yeah, that's true. I, I kind of wrote him off because he just hasn't been around and it didn't look like he was going to be healthy. But yeah, if he's healthy, Velveteen Dream certainly makes the most sense. Like, if he's not healthy, though, there's no one else that's, like, sort of in this storyline. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking it's going to be Dream, though. I mean, I, like you said, nothing else kind of makes sense and nobody's really, really ready for that spot because Gargan is obviously not wrestling. So, yeah, we'll see. Uh, next up, we were supposed to have Killian Dane versus Pete Dunne. That did not happen because Damian Priest got involved, attacked Dane, stared Dunn with, uh, down with Dunn. They charged at each other. They brawled. Dane got involved. Security broke him up. Damian Priest uh, then beat the shit out of them, hit a big splash mountain bomb onto the pile on the floor, hit the step-up tope to take out uh, Dunn and Dane. And uh, we're still we're still building to that triple threat that's eventually coming. I I like the build should be a good triple threat. Damian Priest kind of over at full sale. Got a good reaction here, so that's good. Good on him. And I, I like all three guys. I, I really like Dunn and Damian Priest. This feud, I don't know. Like it's it doesn't do a ton for me. It's just kind of an odd group of guys to be to be throwing in into a feud and the it hasn't like completely clicked even if i, I like two two of the three really well and, and killy name's fine and i think i think the the match will be good but uh the yeah the angle sets up the triple threat should be a good match but this this overall feud isn't really yeah, it, it me comes off hard. a little odd and clunky at times but i think the match will be really good so it's like, at least the build is not bad. It may be a little uneven, but it's not bad. I will say that. Uh, yeah, Mia yeah, Yim is interviewed about the main event. She knows she has to look over her shoulder tonight. Dakota Kai arrived and said that uh, there's no hard feelings with Mia getting uh, picked for Team uh, Rhea Ripley, and that if something goes down tonight, she promised to have her back. And I think at every, I think almost everybody at this point was contemplating if the heel turn was coming, Jeremy. Yeah, Mia Yim doesn't do a ton for me, but I do like this angle. With they announced Dakota that Kai. next week, Dijakovic versus Cole in a ladder match for the War Games Advantage, which they were doing here in the main event tonight. Can Adam Cole get a break? This man has a fractured wrist, and like legitimately, and they put him in, you know, he's wrestling Brian and Seth Rollins. He's wrestling, and then who, who would he wrestle on uh, NXT that that week? He wrestled in the 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 six man, didn't he, or the tag team match? I I didn't. I just now watched the show, but um, no, he he attacked. He wasn't in that six man. Still, he wrestled two matches on the week on on short notice. Now they're putting him in a ladder match. They're putting him in war games uh, next week, like. Jesus Christ! Could could Kyle O'Reilly not do this match? Yeah, he might die in a ladder match. Could well, somebody else not do it's it? Like I am not number one. I'm not a fan of them booking back to back ladder matches with the same stipulation. I think that's a little overkill yeah. going into war games. Second of all, I agree with you on the Adam Cole thing. 
I think it's a huge mistake booking him in a ladder match with a fucked up hand and wrist ahead of war games. You're you're asking for trouble. But you you're booking him in a ladder match. You're booking him in a war games match. He's probably going to be part of Team NXT at Survivor Series. Like you're, is it next week the go home show for for war games as well? Yeah. Are, are we we that close? Yeah. So you're you're literally booking this guy in three matches, two of which are are gimmick matches, which already have a a high risk of of injury possibility he already has a fractured wrist and then you expect him to be healthy for survivor Series, assuming he's on the team that, that's not confirmed i'm just assuming that he is because he's part of the whole invasion angle and they're not doing the the title versus title versus title match so you know what else is he gonna do um it, it's just an unnecessary risk again put Put somebody else in that match. Put uh, Fish Put or O'Reilly Kyle in the there, match. Dude, seriously, it, uh, they really should. I So I don't like the booking of that. I think it's very risky. Very, very risky. I just... And then they'll have them wrestle in Poughkeepsie on oh, Thursday Christ night or something. Uh, so next up was the ladder match for the advantage in the women's war game match. Io Shirai defeated Mia Yim in 20 minutes. Jeremy, your thoughts? Um, I'm glad Mia Yim's not dead. Uh, Cause Jesus, that bump she took to the outside looked like it absolutely sucked. And she got busted open in this match as well. It was a great match, like really awesome uh, ladder match. And uh, both both these ladies went out there to with something to prove. And I mean, the the heels winning is the right call because only an idiot would have a babyface advantage <laughs> in war games. And I guess I'm. Yeah, um, I think WCW almost tried to do it once, but they they didn't. Uh, I think I think Bischoff wanted to do it and was like talked out of it from. But maybe I'm misremembering that. TNA definitely did it though. So yeah, that was just what what a company. Uh, so yeah, the the heel winning the right call. EO rules. I love EO. I, I want just EO she, in my she's life. She's amazing. Yeah, she uh. Uh, Jeremy spoke about Mia getting busted open. EO hit a missile drop kick at one point to a ladder into Mia's face, which is what busted her open. Uh, they had to scramble at that point because they, uh, you know, they, EO was doing a gimmick where she had her hand attacked earlier in the match. So she was, she did an awesome job of so many little things in this match, selling her hand, having trouble opening the ladder and stuff like that. Which gave them time to clean up Mio and Mia and for the ref to communicate what was going on. Uh, that led to the finishing stretch where the NXT UK Women's Champion Kaylee Ray arrived, took out Dakota Kai, toppled over the ladder as Mia was climbing and sent her through the ladder bridge at ringside, which is where she almost died. That allowed Io to win to get the advantage for the heel team and also set up Kaylee Ray joining Team Baszler. Is the final edition, which very cool edition. I actually like her getting involved in this. Team Shayna Baszler was about to have a big celebration on the ramp, but pissed off Pam arrived as Bailey attacked her with chair shots and laid her out until she was chased away to close the show. So, was Bailey the mystery attacker all night, Jeremy? I I guess so. That's what it seemed like. I think she tweeted that. That, you know, it was kind of her and she laid everybody out. So I, I guess that mystery is solved. Kaylee Ray is a cool addition to um, team Shayna Baszler because, yeah, it looked like a Dakota Kai heel turn was potentially coming there. And they did a nice job of, of teasing that. But I'm glad they, they didn't do it. Like, it, that's something you can... One, it's not even necessary. Like, does anybody really want to see Dakota Kai be a heel? Um, two, it's something you could potentially revisit in the future as, you know, more motivation down the line for why she is turning heel. Hey, remember when you guys overlooked me at, at war games? Like, you can use that as part of her motivation. So I, I like that they didn't, like, just pull the trigger on this 
after a week. Like I thought the MJF feud or the heel turn was uh, maybe a little too quickly. And this one, they're they're doing a, a seemingly of a, a slow burn of it. So I like that. And uh, Kaylee Ray again, a, a cool addition because kind of unexpected. I don't think many people really thought that Kaylee Ray was going to be the the final participant for for team Shayna Baszler and it gets NXT UK on there. They're, they're obviously, you know, there's a lot of brand synergy there. NXT UK is just a, a dead show. I can't even remember the last time Kaylee Ray appeared on that show. And I granted I'm a couple weeks behind, but it, it's a, it's a dead show. Walter and Imperium are pretty much just regular NXT guys at this point as well. And Bailey, cool, cool appearance by her coming attacking everybody and keeps that uh, women's feud going live the the women women were awesome at the the end of this a, a lot of a lot of yeah, good great stuff main from event them. we've talked about especially the past few weeks the the NXT women overall have been really killing it especially the ones involved in the war games match um just i mean it's been the, it's been the best stuff for for me like the uh, on NXT and you know the the guys war game stuff has, has been strong as well but the women's war game stuff is just yeah, really Yeah, I think home. they're doing an excellent job with it. I think um Bailey I, I love the fact that Bailey was so frustrated with NXT that she flew back from Europe just to beat the shit out of some people. So, awesome. Yeah, I mean, got to do Got to do what you got to do sometimes. Hey, Shayna Baszler flew in from Florida just to beat the shit out of her when the, you know everybody got trapped in Saudi. So Bailey's like, all right, I can Florida, do this shit dude. too. Bailey came from Europe. She was pissed. Well, pissed off Pam, as as you call her, is you know it's an appropriate name. All for right, her. Jeremy. So that brings us to the big head-to-head comparison for the week, sir. I will go to you first. Um, NXT had the better match. I, I thought the the women's ladder match was my favorite match on the night, so they they win there. I think AEW had the best segment though, as the Jericho MJF Cody Wardlow segment was my my favorite segment of the night. I will go with. I, I will slightly lean, and it always seems to be like it's a slightly lean because both these shows are really good. I will slightly lean NXT because I, I really like the match, the the main event, and I thought they did more good work towards building towards war games. And AEW, while a great show, flat finish, which hurts it a little bit, even though, again, I, I like the, the small package finish. It just, it's not translating right now for them. And some, some good wrestling, strong angle. I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm leaning towards NXT. That's what I thought AEW says. was a very good show again this week. I do like that. They seem to be taking some criticisms to heart and are changing up the formatting of the show a little bit, mixing things up think it's a necessary change and again uh, Jeremy and I we talked about this on the last show we went pretty heavy into a lot of that Uh, and I uh, some I thought they listen I'd like to think Tony Khan's listening I mean I I know some people thought we were trying to be negative to be negative and we weren't it's just like again nothing is perfect AEW isn't perfect WWE NXT New Japan whatever it is nothing is perfect you can make changes you can make alterations you can always improve your show so I credit them for doing that. I thought the Moxley promo was really good. I thought the Jericho MJF Cody Wardlow segment, like you said, probably the best overall segment of the night. Really good promo work there. Really enjoyed that. Good wrestling overall overnight. And I thought they did a nice job coming out of the pay-per-view. NXT, I thought, had a lot of really good overall build to war games. Had the best match, I agree, with the Io Shirai Mia Yim match in the main event there. Overall, I thought the wrestling was a little better combined on NXT than AEW. And as you said, it's a slim margin pretty much every week because I think both shows are really good every week. It just depends on what you're going to value and what kind of hits you more. I am also going NXT this week. I gave it the slight nod in my overall scores tonight. But again, I don't think you can go wrong with either one of these shows, Jeremy. It was... um. If you're watching all four hours of these shows or whatever it is, minus commercials by the time you get to your second show, 
But still, you're about four hours deep on Wednesday nights. You can't go wrong because the shows are delivering every week and I'm really enjoying them. But yeah, I will go NXT this week as well. I think the the first half hour sort of hurt Dynamite. And, and okay, the Moxley promo was good. Like the the match was was throwaway. The the Dark Order Jurassic Express match, like not a bad match or anything. And then the Luchasaurus returned and stuff. But the Dark Order stuff not really connecting. And then you got Sean Spears and the Librarian coming out there. And like Darby's over, but that was a throwaway match. Just a lot of throwaway matches in in that first. Um, half hour and an hour like there was like what three i mean the darby allen match wasn't technically a squash but it, it went only three four minutes like there were three just really short matches in, in that first hour and the the dark order match was good but yeah it wasn't you know anything spectacular like it, i don't i didn't think it was as good as the the leo rush and, and garza match so the wrestling was stronger on nxt the the angle work w- was stronger on on dynamite so it comes down to i guess your, your kind of preference on that is you know if you like the sort of heavy angle show on dynamite you probably enjoyed that more if you like the the more wrestling heavy show you you probably enjoyed yeah. nxt but again more. very good shows wednesday nights remains the best night of the week it's great it's it's always great and uh, we will see is this the week nxt wins the ratings they they were really close last week uh, we didn't get a chance to to talk about it because i i hadn't seen the nxt show yet and i was away but it, it was what it was just a a few thousand viewers that it was like nine uh, like you know nine nxt was right there that, with them if that yeah not a lot um yeah i mean it, it's possible but like they didn't do a lot of NXT heavy stuff on Raw and SmackDown this week. Yeah, it was really the the NXT UK stuff with and then you know Walter and those guys weren't even on the the show tonight. So yeah, it's um, it, I I think Dynamite is going to win this week, and I think the gap is actually bigger than what it was last week. I think last week was a, a boost because of. The, the strong uh, nights for SmackDown Raw with the NXT invasions, but we didn't get that this week. AEW coming off a strong pay-per-view um, with, with some big fallout kind of questions, typically or mainly the MJF turn. Uh, I think there, there was just sort of more interest in AEW coming into – like. Me personally, I was way more interested than than Dynamite over NXT. And NXT show was really strong last week too, but they almost lost the momentum because they did the UK shows and they weren't flying over the NXT roster for the the Raw and SmackDown UK show. And so they they sort of hurt their own momentum in 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 that regard. So I, I think the the gap is is back to a good I'd be really surprised if it wasn't over 50,000. I, I think it'll still be pretty close, but I, I'm confident in saying it will be it'll be 75,000. I think the, the combination least. of WWE not following up on the main NXT guys on Raw and SmackDown combined with AEW coming off of a pay-per-view because traditionally most wrestling shows will see a bump after a pay-per-view. Because of the curiosity and the fallout yeah. factor. So, I mean, I would think AEW wins this week. If they don't, that I would think is not good. Because, again, WWE did almost nothing with the NXT stuff outside of the NXT UK stuff. So, I would look at that as a big negative if they lost this week. I think next week is the week that NXT uh wins because it's the go home for takeover and survivor series you know they're gonna push the the nxt stuff fairly heavy on smackdown i think it's gonna get a huge push on raw um and and then of course you have the nxt show so i i think next week is going to be the the show where nxt 
if they don't win, it'll once again be like a, a neck and neck thing. But this week, AEW should should certainly win um, by a, a, I, like I don't know what a decent margin is anymore. But again, I, I think it'll be over fifty thousand, and I I'm, I'm even saying it'll be over seventy five thousand. But yeah, if they don't win this week, then that is pretty big cause for concern because. Yeah, WWE didn't do a whole lot, and you know, last week could have just swung everything and shown that okay, you know, we got the eyeballs on us. People are now see this as a WWE show. We're getting that kind of WWE core fan base tuning in and everything, and so that's that's really what they need. You get that core fan base tuning in. We know two million people are watching Raw every week, and nearly three million are watching smackdown every week so we know what that core is out there once you start attracting those guys you can you can get there and stay I there i think you're right in while. the fact that next week really does feel like the week that nxt could and should win especially if they get some good time on smackdown and especially raw that does feel like the week heading into that big pay-per-view weekend I, th- I think you're definitely going to get main roster guys because you didn't really have that tonight. You had Bailey, um, but you know pretty much everybody was on the the European tour, so you couldn't really do a big angle um, this week. You know everybody will be back in town next week, and because it is the go home for Survivor Series and NXT is part of Survivor Series, and they've already done all these invasion stuff. I think you're going to see next week you like the OC will probably show back up like I don't know what team NXT is 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 going to be our, um for Survivor Series but shit it wouldn't shock me if if uh, we get the big dog in the in the impact zone. There you go. That'd be funny. We'll see what happens. But yeah, so that that's it for this week, Jeremy. Um again, really good Wednesday night. I got, love Wednesday nights, man. No complaints for me at all. Overall, I mean, obviously we can nitpick certain things, but just as an overall experience, Wednesdays are just so much fun. Yes, um, especially compared to Raw and SmackDown this this past week because they were taped shows in the UK and they sucked. So that brings us to a close for this week. Again, you were listening to the 411 on Wrestling Podcast. You guys can follow us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, and of course the 411mania.com website. Please make sure to subscribe to the show, share us around on social media, and if you have time, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. We will talk to you guys later on.